This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have legendary guitarist for the specials, Roddy Radiation. You've been touring here in the States for a while with your band, the Ska Billy Rebels. The specials are not touring until uh, April. We play Ireland. So, like, just to fill time, I thought I'd come over here and do a few gigs. Tell me where you were raised and what it was in your youth that led you to music. I was born and bred in Coventry, which is uh, right in the middle of England. Uh, it's near Stratford on Avon, you know, like William Sp uh, Shakespeare's uh, birthplace. Uh, my father played trumpet in a soul band and uh, he got me into music. You end up come bringing together a band called the Wild Boys. Yeah, that was sort of pre-punk really, it was sort of uh, inspired by Bowie, Bolan, uh, Iggy Pop, and we were doing a few of my songs which I later did with the specials. Concrete Jungle. Yeah, Concrete Jungle was the song I brought to the specials just about living in Coventry in a rough area of town and trying to get home from the pub without getting beaten up, you know. Can you define the title Teddy Boy? Well, what is a Teddy Boy? A teddy Boys was sort of used to dress in Edwardian style clothes. Uh, it came a, In England, it, it sort of after Bill Haley came over and uh, the rock and roll thing took off big time in England and uh, they sort of, in, uh, in London, the, the gentlemen's like clothing outfitters had these uh, long draped jackets which they'd made for the ex-soldiers and cavalry officers and stuff and uh, the poor kids in London sort of started wearing them and uh, greasing their hair like Presley and uh, that's where the Teddy Boy thing came in which got revived again in the, the 70s at the same time as uh, the punk thing started. Mods? Well mods sort of started in the sort of mid 60s I guess or early 60s I'm not quite that old, but like, I vaguely remember like the, the Scooter Boys, and it never really died out. There's been you know scooter clubs mm -hmm. all over England ever since the 60s, you know. And uh, we kind of, with the specials, adopted that uh, style of dress, you know, because before that we were all pretty much individuals. I was sort of a punk rocker at the time, and uh, the other guys sort of we all need to have that group identity, so we adopted the, the mod style, you know, which or rude boy style, you know. Skinheads. The original skinheads were sort of uh, big reggae fans and hung out with the Jamaican guys. And later, the some of the right wing people tried to take that image on, you know, which was very unfortunate. And we kind of uh, tried to make sure the skinheads understood we were anti-racist and all that kind of thing, you know. Now, define what a rude boy meant to you. Well, that was uh, part of the, mo the mod sort of uh, image and style, because uh, when the Jamaicans came over in the, the mid to late 50s in England, they, they came over wearing these suits and things and uh, the little port by hats. And uh, the rude boy image was taken from them, you know, sort of like, like the a two-tone man, Walt Jabsko, we use mm -hmm. as our logo in the specials. That was based on uh, Peter Tosh, an early Whalers photo, and uh, Jerry Dammers just uh, drew a port by hat on him, and uh, we used that as a logo with the black and white check thing, which is always a, a mod sort of uh, image anyway. So now, how did the Coventry Automatics come together to become the specials? Well, we were all in different bands, you know, and uh, Jerry Dammers asked me to join uh, one night in a a late night drinking then. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was joking actually. I said, you want to come down to London and play some lead guitar with my band? And I think, yeah, great, you know. And I went, went home, went to bed, and next I know there's someone kicking my door the next morning saying, you ready? I went, what? I don't you want to come and record in London? Said, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Grabbed my guitar and got my amp, and uh, actually like Jerry Dammers and uh, the guy who was, who was sort of managing at the time, who was uh, Pete Waterman, who mm -hmm. was like, uh, went on to be a producer yeah, and songwriter. Sort of a, lot, a lot of uh, very middle of the road pop, but it's quite yeah. funny he was sort of backing us then. He tried to sell us to all, all the different uh, record labels. No one's interested at the time, you know, because it was too odd, that mixture of like reggae, punk, and, uh, and we later adopted the Scar thing because it fitted better with the, the music, you know. How well did you get to know The Clash when you uh, opened for them on their on parole tour in 1978? They were very good to us, very very friendly, you know. And uh, I wouldn't say I was uh, best friends with Joe Strummer, but he always 
spent time to talk to me and you know like it was a couple of years older than me and in them days you know it's like when you in your 20s two years is like a lifetime you know but I got on great with Paul and Topper and Mick as well you know like Mick was always very friendly. How did the Clash manager Bernie oh, Rhodes, Bernie, yeah. <laughs> how did he differ from Rick Rogers? Well I think Rick was a bit more laid back and he let Jerry sort of do his own thing whereas like Bernie Rhodes would talk in, uh, I don't know. Well, he, he had very def Well, he actually said to us, you've got to get an image, you know, because we all looked so different, you know. So, I, well, we all had different images, so he, he kind of helped there. But we were sort of uh, sleeping rough at the Clash's rehearsal studios, you know. The drummer was like sleeping one night and a rat ran over his chest, you know. With little, very little money and, uh, you know, we didn't eat much. And we went over to Paris and did a gig there, and that's what we wrote Gangsters about, because we got involved with some uh, very dodgy characters. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they were sort of helping us in a funny kind of way. But we, uh, we stayed in this hotel, and the damned had stayed there the week before, and they'd smashed the place up and hadn't paid their bill. So we turned up uh, with the same promoter and the same thing. So the manageress said, like, look, you pay your bill now. I said, we just paid our bill. Said, no, you, you've paid for last, the dam's bill. So they took our guitars off us. So we were, we were panicking, thinking, what are we going to do? You know, so we went back to the club, told the club owner, and he told his bosses. And these two uh, mafioso-looking guys turned up. And one of them uh, said, you know, offered me a mint. And as he pulled his jacket off, I seen there was a, a shooter there, you know. So they went, had, went into the hotel, I had a quick chat with them and they gave us the guitars back straight away. You know, so I don't know what they said to them, but uh, they looked pretty scared. That's a good story, I like that. Yeah, well I was, I was pretty young at the time and uh, you know, it was all new to me. It was uh, the second time I'd been out of England, you know, I'd, I'd been to Belgium on a school trip, you know, but it was my first, and we, we had to hitchhike from uh, Calais to Paris because we had a van, but uh, Bernie Rhodes upset our driver, so we loaded the gear onto a trolley, onto the ferry, and they had a van meters at the other side, but it was only a little small van. So the black guys get in there, because they think they're not going to get picked up hitching, you know, because, well, you know. Yeah. So we had the hitch, and uh, the first lift we got was on a Rolls Royce. You know, <laughs> it was some chauffeur who was take, going to pick his bus up. So <laughs> we were hitching, and it's like, no, we're not, this Rolls Royce is not going to stop for us, you know, like four guys, their thumbs stuck out, and he did, and he gave us some cigarettes, and uh, we got halfway there, and then me and Jerry Damas uh, begged a, a truck driver to take us the rest of the way. So we got into Paris, and uh, lay down on a park bench, and went to sleep. <laughs> it was great, I wouldn't like to do it again, you know, like I'm a bit old for that now, but uh, in them days, we could take uh, that sleep in the rough. Some of the Clash tour, we slept in the van. We'd stolen the big judo mat from, from a gig, we just put it on top of the equipment and all lay on that and slept, you know. Character building stuff, you know. Was it the special's goal to create a new multiracial blueprint for music? Well, Jerry Dammers had the thing, the idea about creating a movement, not just like a band. He, he wanted the record label. We'd been off, uh, uh, Mick Jagger had turned up at one of the gigs in London, asked us to sign to Rolling Stones Records, but Jerry wanted this label thing. So we, we had, at that time, you know, umpteen offers from all the major labels, but Christmas Records said we could have like our own label and pick our own bands to create a movement, you know, which is all mostly, it was mostly Jerry Dammers' idea. Like, I think most of us were just glad to get a record deal, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you think Jerry Dammers was a genius? <laughs> He's a very clever guy, a bit eccentric, and not all his ideas are great, but uh, I probably wouldn't be here today, I hadn't been for him. What were the pros and cons of having Elvis Costello produce the first specials record? The pros were sort of like, he, he came to a lot of our early gigs, he, he'd like done watching the te detectives, you know, and he got heavily into early Scar and that. And uh, we thought like, being he was that keen, and it was better than having some hot shot producer, mm -hmm. you know, do it, so he, he, he produced it. But he did say to Jerry Dammers, you want to lose the punk guitarist, me. Because he couldn't, so even listen to the early 60s Scar, he didn't hear the rock and roll Johnny Thunder sort of mm -hmm. like punk guitar, you know. So he told them to sack me. But they didn't, and uh, 
apparently I invented ska punk. Yeah. <laughs> but it's basically so that's the only way I could play at the time. You know, I've since learned how to play reggae and ska, but uh, in them days I was still, you know, playing rock and roll punk. You know. That's well, the it, innovation. Well, that's it. It's sort of like nothing's really totally new. It's like hence my new band, the Scully Rebels. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a mixture of rockabilly and uh, ska, which sounds a bit odd. But if you go back to the roots of sort of ska, they, it's Fats Domino, you know, they, they were huge Fats Domino fans. So like they picked up on the radio and he toured there a lot. And that's the same roots as rock and roll. So you just go back a bit and uh, change the beats around a bit and uh, ska billy. What do you remember about touring with the Go-Go's and the Body Snatchers? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember, like, well, what, what I can say about it, you know. Uh, hey, feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of different to, like, get on the tour bus. We, we had, like, these English school coaches. It wasn't like a plush tour bus like you have nowadays. So, like, you got on the, the bus in the morning with a hangover or whatever. And there'd be all these girls going, wing, 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 chatting away like crazy, you know, and it was like, oh, shut up. <laughs> but yeah, it was great because, you know, you sort of actually made an effort to shave and comb your hair every morning because there's ladies there, you know, yeah. and you watch your language and stuff. They were great. The Go-Go's I, I loved, you know, and the Body Snatchers were good friends of ours, you know. Yeah, it, it was nice. It was good fun. Any uh, particular personalities about the Go-Go's? Yeah, I, Linda was uh, nice. I, I didn't really get to know them that well. I remember they had a was it bass player or the drummer, who was a bit of a hard drinker. I think she got the sack after that tour. I don't know. I, I tend, I'm not really a forward kind of guy, so I'm a bit shy and quiet mainly. But I got, I got to know some of the body snatchers, you know. And the less said about that, the better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. What was your impression of Chrissy Hine when she came in the studio to sing backup vocals well, on Nightclub? Yeah, well, we, we'd met her. Like, it, it was the Clash, the Pretenders, and uh, Ian Jury's band who came to see us. And they're the, one, they're the ones that sort of said to the press, like, you've got to see these guys. Then the press picked up on it, and then the record companies picked on it. But, uh, no, Chrissy Hine came to a lot of the early shows, you know. And... Uh, she was great, you know, nice girl, and she she did the backing vocals on nightclub and uh, hung out with us, and yeah, she was nice. We did quite a few gigs with the Pretenders. I knew, I knew the bass player and the guitarist are sadly dead now, you know. Yeah, you knew Pete Farndon and, yeah, and James Yeah, Pete, Pete was Scott. great. Pete got his Triumph and he got all the rocker gear and that, you know, it was great. And then James Honeyman Scott. I didn't really know him so well, but uh, he seemed a nice little guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's just sad that they got into all the stupid drug business, you know. Yeah, the heroin. Yeah, we, we were, <clears throat> with the specials, we were mainly sort of beer drinkers, you know. Mm -hmm. We didn't really dabble in uh, heavy drugs. So now, why was recording more specials, why was that a nightmare? <laughs> well, I guess it was because, uh, in my opinion, I think we should have done another Scar punk album. But Jerry, being Jerry, he thought it was time to completely change the whole sound. And some of us weren't over keen on uh, his jazz lounge music take on it, you know. And like, I got very angry when uh, he wanted to do Halo Rich Girl with a drum machine. And I'm going, like, no, you know, you're not going to do that. So I pulled a switch by that and stuck it at the top of my amp and said, no, we're not doing it with a drum machine. And he just ran off someplace, you know. So we did it without him, you know. And he came, put the keys on afterwards. I wasn't going to hurt him. It was just, uh, I had to make a stand, you know. But out of that came Ghost Town, yeah, well, which was huge. We didn't realise at the time what, what, what great idea he had. You know, we just thought, oh, he's doing a, he's doing a heavy reggae song. You know, and uh, it, uh, it's probably the most popular thing we ever did. And they, they, they used it for the soundtrack for the riots that mm -hmm. came just after we did the song, which was kind of uncanny, you know, like, almost like uh, predicted it, you know. Exactly, and it, plus it's been in a ton of great movies also. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I wish I always want to put my, my songs in a movie, you know. <laughs> what are your fondest memories of, of your of your times with the specials, the early times? I really enjoyed the Saturday Night Live thing we did. It was a bit crazy, you know. We were all pretty tired and not getting on too well together, but I didn't see it until the 90s, but uh -huh. uh, you can see the energy that we had at that time, you know. If we still got it now, but because we're a bit older, we slowed down a little bit, you know, like we don't run around so much, but we try to, you know. The blaring out show. 